uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here uh, at, a, at a packed house. Um, if I was to start this talk with an emoji, it would be with a bomb, and I'll end it with a fist bump. This, to be clear, has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But I'm showing this just because it intrigues me, and I showed it once about six months ago, and everyone was sort of just mesmerized at it. Like, what the hell is that? Does anyone know what this is? Yeah, it's, it's beautiful to look at. And if you, if you see, generally, there's some fireworks coming from the east headed towards the west. And there's generally nothing happening in Russia. Um, so this is a live data visualization of cybersecurity attacks in the world. And this was shown to me last summer by, I don't ask why, an ex-CIA operative. Uh, he wouldn't sort of go into it, but he was like, this, this is what cybersecurity is about. This is real. It's happening all the time. And you can kind of guess where people are trying to extract information and steal things from. Um, these are types of attacks, and you see these beautiful explosions like that every now and again. Um, so anyway, we can move on to what I'm here to talk about. I just wanted to show you that in case it was interesting. Cool. All right. So, so that's me. Um, I am a creative director. I work for an agency. Uh, maybe a little frustrated seeing the installation talk at the beginning. You know, like the freedom of that, incredible work. Um, basically, the role of RGA is quite simple. Um, the world is evolving at a rapid state. We try and leverage that technology change to the advantage of brands. Um, we do things like we worked on the, the Nike Plus Apple Watch, and you know, that is somewhat symbolic of rapid business change, data change, commerce change, and communication change, all kind of wrapped into one, right? And, uh, and just to get a little crunchy here, uh, there's, not gonna be, there's only four graphs in this, I promise, but a little crunchy because I've been reading a lot about futurists recently. I'm geeking out on futurists and, and blockchain. So, so we're going to, we're in our lifetime, go through this crazy evolution. And basically, we're there. So we've gone through this period where the human brain is this beautiful thing. And now all of a sudden, the machine is creeping up on us. And what these guys are predicting, that 23 years from now, you're going to have artificial general intelligence. What that means is machines will be kind of like us. You'll be able to ask it something and it'll respond kind of effortlessly. What they're saying in 43 years from now is that you'll have artificial superintelligence. That means machines can operate at a multiplier of the human brain. So things like, can we cure cancer? it might just invent a way to do so, because it can think 10 times better than we can. So we look at this, and then you start to see one of my favorite films ever. In 68, this iconic film, sci-fi film, launched uh, with an immense soundtrack and a very intriguing character called Hal. 50 years forward, uh, we have this device available to us for 100, 150 odd bucks, sits in our, our countertop, and you can ask it to get you an Uber. That's amazing. And it won't be long before you'll be able to say, hey, Alexa, I'm thinking of buying a BMW, two-liter engine, maybe 30,000 miles. Uh, can you give me three insurance quotes? Like, OK, James. Here's one from here, one from here, one from here. And I'll be like, OK, go and make that one happen. That's probably quite imminent. And so you go to things like this, a beautiful film in her. And this probably is around a 2040 sort of time frame where these things will sort of act more as a companion to you than some sort of weird thing that talks back to you robotically. So just setting the context of that, that's why we're sort of really interested in, in technology because it's going to become part of our lives. It's a fundamental part of our lives already. And it's really changing what we make and how we make it. So right now, I think there's equal opportunity to be absolutely overwhelmed. Possibly if you read the wrong stuff, absolutely terrified. Um, but for me, there's no better time in the world um, uh, to be a creative. This is what I look at as the new creative canvas. It's unbelievable. The days of sort of TV and print, you've evolved. And this is your arsenal now, from commerce to natural language, pro natural language processing, everything in between. This is what's at the disposal of creative. And just to give you some, some, some stuff that is intriguing to us right now, so I don't know if anyone's read up on blockchain. I, I have recently, because some guys in our office have just got these laptops running, and they mine bitcoins, if that even means anything to anyone. They make bitcoins just by running stuff. And for example, if you put 10 grand into bitcoin in 2010, it'd be worth 200 million now. 
$200 million. And so there's this whole new internet that's about to evolve. People are looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? Blockchain is going to be pretty much the third chapter of the internet, where basically it's going to potentially eliminate middlemen. So for example here, Imogen Heap, if anyone knows Imogen Heap, Grammy award-winning artist, she did an experiment with Ujo Music on blockchain, whereby she published a song. And for that song, she basically wrote a contract for it. Like, you can download it for this much, you can stream it for that much, and I'll give you the stems so you can get the vocals, you can get the percussion for this much. And you can use it in these different ways. There's no labels, no nothing. What you pay is what she gets. And with that, you see the credits of the drummer, the guitarist, the bass player, and they get it too. So this is sort of symbolic of a complete change where all these middlemen sort of taking money from everyone, from the creators in the world, which is a huge issue in the music industry. This is going to completely change in this era where I listen to something, I pay you for it, you get 100% of it, right? This is another one for, for me kind of interesting. Like in social media, we all, in the, as in the last talk, we're publishing content all the time. A brand asks us to do something, we feverishly go and do it. Do we get something for it? No. Does Facebook? Absolutely. Does the brand? Absolutely. From money to fame to the aura of, of everything that goes with it. This is something where basically you will get rewarded for content you create and how it's consumed. Super simple, right? I put something out there, I've created a, a, a very good video or, 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 or still image. I could get rewarded in cryptocurrency that goes up at a rate of knots. From a mobile perspective, um, this sort of blew the minds of some fashion guys I was talking with. I met this, uh, this professor from Cornell University in uh, upstate New York. His, his work is to innovate cotton. So he basically puts nanotechnology in cotton. What does that mean? This t-shirt could be a fleece in winter, and it also can go from black to red. What the hell does a designer do if I work for Louis Vuitton? Now I've got a dress where I walk out on the runway. The time I get to the end of the runway, it's gold. It was blue a minute ago. So, you know, all of this stuff is completely changing. Think of that if you're FC Barcelona. Why do I need three kits anymore? I don't. I just give it a little rub. It goes from green to blue. So, you know, like everything is sort of changing pretty radically. Um, this is a company that's uh, come through our venture program. Basically, a tiny chip. You could put it in this jacket, in a, in a button, turn any sort of object into a connected um, payment device. So I can just walk through the subway effortlessly. Um, and this, from a, from a VR, virtual reality perspective, has anyone seen this, the Ghostbusters experience? No? This is mind-blowing. This is done with Sony uh, for Madame Tussauds in Times Square in partnership with a startup called Void in, in Utah in, in, uh, in the US. They're basically mapping real environments, overlaying it with a virtual environment. So you can sit down in chairs, you can touch walls, they all have completely different purposes. You've got a haptic plate on your chest, You've got a computer on your back, and you've got some awesome tracking. So everything becomes this hyper-real environment. It's ridiculous. Look at this. There's a friggin' dragon that just lands in front of their face. And they can touch the walls in this environment. It's incredible. Um, and then the last couple of things. I'm not going to play this video because it's hyper-geeky, but you know, bankies have got, banking's got a sort of big old problem. It hasn't really evolved in about 30 years. And so with this thing, you can basically just say, hey, what's my balance? Uh, I want a new pair of jeans. Can I afford it? Uh, no, you can't, but I'll give you a loan because you're good for it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, like, obviously, natural language processing. Everyone, it's like, I'm a creative director. Every deck you see now, there's a bot in it. It's like the new thing. Um, so, the, the, you know, we've just done one uh, for, for the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. You can imagine what it is. It helps you get to nightclubs. It helps you get pizza at 9 a.m. in the morning. It helps you get drunk again for the fifth day in a row. So, so what I'm going to sort of focus on here is a little bit of, of these last two. Because the reason being, if there's, if there's brands in the room, I think most brands would cherish the moment they could have a one-to-one -one conversation with someone. Because that's the moment that you can truly be understood. And social media is this one to everyone. So I've got a bit of a mask on me as far as what I'm willing to say, because I don't want to sort of project the wrong image or come across uncool. 
So if I could actually talk to you one-to-one, -one, that would be pretty mind-blowing. But just one thing I'm seeing in this race, and there's bots sort of like coming across everywhere, they're all kind of bland. They don't really have a personality as such. You could change the logo out, and it'd be sort of from a, just another fashion brand. So I think, you know, the worry that you see with all this technology is just don't forget the humanity. We're people. Let's use it. Let's not just lead with technology. Let's lead with being a sort of person with a personality. And so you look at Siri. Siri is mind-blowingly powerful. It's incredible, like Alexa. But what would happen if you rolled over in the middle of the night and you were f almost sort of like in the slumber, you know, maybe sort of slightly hungover, and, and you just roll over and ask Siri a question? Siri would shout back at you. She wouldn't whisper because she knows you're asleep. Right? So there's a lot of things in this technology which is just not sort of really set up um, from a humanities perspective right now. So that's why my sort of philosophy on this, and usually you put the title of the talk at the beginning, not the middle, but, you know, well, my philosophy is to be more Samantha than Siri, if you've seen the film Her. It becomes more of a companion where you sort of forget the technology and you get immersed in the value and the service and the loveliness that comes with it. The problem with this is it's about 20 years out. And everyone's kind of running there now to actually sort of think that this is a reality. Don't forget people is what I'm trying to say. So we did this, uh, this pilot for Nike in Berlin last year. And it was a very simple, simple um, uh, ask in many ways. Nike has 50 million people on their running apps. Um, so Nike Run Club, if anyone uses it, I see lots of Nike sneakers. Um, but how can I service you one-to-one? -one? So you don't actually have to download an app. You can just say, I flew in this morning from London. Uh, I want to go for a quick run. Why can't I just say that? Why do I have to download an app, trawl through navigation, find some runs locally in Amsterdam? So we had this just simple thought. If I could just say to Nike, hey, help me crush my goals. Just hey, Nike, what would that be? So we created this service called Nike On Demand. Um, and this is a, a video about how it came to be. It's kind of simple, but I guess, yeah, you know, like to, not to burst the bubble that, you know, you can just switch on the machine and it just suddenly comes to life as a human being. Yeah, you know, this was just a very simple exercise. If we tried our hardest to sort of think about how we could automate this in a really meaningful, emotional way. But Nike speaks in a very specific language. There's a tone to it. There's words that are very specific to it. Uh, there's an emotional quality to it. So the thing for us that is so important is starting that conversation. Because in order to learn, you've got to start somewhere. And this literally was a conversation. You say, hey, Nike. In its own right, when was the last time you said hey to a brand? 
it's not a normal behavior to sort of converse with a brand like a friend. And the thing we got to with this is this intimate understanding. Like we had a girl who came on the, the platform. It's anonymized, so I, I don't know who. But she basically was going to go on a honeymoon. So she wants to training program to get fit for a honeymoon. It started very simple like that. But then you proceed three or four weeks. We're getting selfies from her on the beach saying, hey, Nike, you smashed it. Like, that's not a normal sort of behavior, but you can see the intimacy through this because you've gone from just a simple sort of question through this journey where you provide distinct value in a one-to-one, -one. so it's complete intimacy. You know, her shield is down, and then you've got the results where she's willing to send you a photo of her on one of the sort of best moments of her life um, and showing the results of, of this. And you see there's, there's interesting things going on here. Hey, Nike, hey, Nat, know a good run nearby. Now, typically, in an interface, you'd then be like, oh, hang on a second, how long, what's your pace, how many calories are you looking to lose, do you want it outside, inside, um, you know, what's your sort of history, can you do marathons or 5Ks, or are you just kind of like a five-minute runner? In this, I'm just asking, know a good run nearby. We already know what you run like, we have that data. But by taking that data and combining it with experts who can look at it, assess it, and respond, you're getting a very human response in back. I got you covered. Here's a map. We know you're doing 5Ks. We know we're doing it outside. You run parks. Here's a map. Done. Simple. And you get a very simple uh, ending to that. So I'm not going to read these stats, but yeah, I think the big thing here we're trying to get to is this intimacy of relationship. You typically kind of, you know, like, I, I think people are in, imposing themselves on your world a lot, you know, through advertising. You know, advertising is this disruption. It's sort of, I want to exist in your space. I'm interrupting you and what you're doing, whether it's in your feed or sort of on your TV, on your phone. So what we're trying to do is just get this very simple sort of intimate relationship where we're providing value in a, in a, in a very personable way. And you can see that it actually, like, you know, th this, this works. So where I'd, where I'd sort of wrap this up is two things sort of like blew us away where we got to the end of this. One was a simple statement where someone texted first thing in the morning, hello, guilty conscience. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you're there, you're existing, you're in the everyday world. And the last thing that happened, we got a lot of these. And I just say to you, when was the last time you fist bumped a brand? It just doesn't really happen. So by achieving this and having this thing where you're conversing with a brand just like you would a, a, a mate, you know, for us that is sort of a milestone that uh, I think lots of people are, are trying to achieve. And by doing this, this combination of uh, data, intelligence, and, and experts, we managed to pull this off and prove that there is a model that we can sort of combine the both things uh, to try and get towards something that I guess going from cybersecurity at the beginning and machine learning and everything else, just trying to make a more human future. So it's just sort of a flood of technology coming at us that's all a little sterile and generic. So, so that's, that's where I'll, I'll leave you today. Hopefully that was a sort of a quick fly through uh, where we see sort of like the state of play evolving, uh, technologies that are sort of really intriguing us right now, and how we're trying to combine the best of creativity and data to provide really compelling services for brands. Is that you? Thank you very much. Thank you.